Hello everyone, it looks like we're live. I'll wait, make sure audio's working okay. And while I wait, I forgot to clean my palette, so actually let's make sure that's working. I may as well include this as a part of the lesson. Okay, sound everything is good. So just, we're going to be working in acrylics tonight. I'm painting a super easy, very simple ocean wave. So if you are a beginner to art or you just want something fun and quick to do, it's a project for you. So starting, no audio. Um, Nick, did you tell me there was a, Refresh. Why aren't you getting audio? Hold on. Yeah. Um, okay. Nope. Um, Joseph is just pulling a Lisa. That's something I would definitely do. Okay. We've got audio. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is show you on these glass palettes. They're so easy to clean. Oh, and my camera's not even close to straight, but whatever wrong direction let's go that way so this is dried from last week I've been working in colored pencil this week so most of that is already dried up so all I'm gonna do is take just water lightly mist that and a glass scraper and off it comes I don't have to push very hard it just comes right up now some of this paint is still wet because of the type of palette that I use it has a lid so it's kind of like using a Tupperware but it's not wet enough because I did not put normally I will put a folded up uh, kind of damp paper towel I don't know why I said kind of, it is. That was a filler word that was unneeded. But I will normally put that damp paper towel and that's gonna keep everything in there wet for weeks. Like I can reuse that paint over and over again. But in this case, that did start to dry. So I'm just gonna scrape all this up and kick myself for wasting perfectly good paint. But for some reason, I forgot to do that. It will just scrape all of that away. Some of that white I can probably mix in, but we'll see. It may be too, too stiff. Oh, and we already have, good timing there, Gibson nose. Look at this. His head just popped up as soon as I said we already have. We have a super chat from Art by MB for the boys. You guys want a super chat? Come on. You can get a super chat. Thank you so much. The boys definitely thank you. They need the extra calories. They both. I switch the type of cookies that I give them and apparently the old ones must have had more calories. So this is a, a story no one needs, but I will tell the story while they lay down because they just got another one. Lay down, lay down. You can't have two in a row unless you're laying down in between. Anyway, they've both lost a little bit of weight and on a Greyhound when they lose any weight, it's way too obvious. So I'm giving them like extra sweet potatoes in their food. We have increased calories significant the last week when I'm like, whoa, you two are both looking a little thin here. I know which it would. It was a certain treat that they were getting that I didn't realize was that high in calories. So anyway, we're having to adjust. They need, moral of the story, they need these super chats tonight. We are happy for any extra calories. And now we have another one from Kathy Davis said, can we start the night with making the pubs happy? Super chat. You guys want another super chat? <laughs> I know, so they say we need the calories. Mom, mom messed up and gave us cookies that don't have enough calories. I know. Who would have thought that treats would make that big of a difference? Because they still get the same amount of treats, just different ones. Yeah, anyway. Gibson looks like he's put some weight back on. You still need a bit more, cow. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Go lay down, boys. Lay down. Lay down. Okay, so let's get over to the actual painting. I am working tonight on a Fredericks watercolor canvas board. And just for transparency, this canvas was provided to me by Fredericks. Fredericks was already, they've been the only brand that I've used since around 2011, 2012. I had enough of the craft stuff that I was getting from like Michaels and Hobby Lobby, like their generic stuff is just terrible. So I had already sworn them off. But Fredericks did provide this for me. This is a watercolor canvas board. And the reason that I'm going with this versus a like, normal acrylic prime can't well it is acrylic prime but it i'm not obviously using watercolor tonight it's just super smooth and so it gives me really nice blending i'm not fighting the tooth of the canvas where it's too bumpy that's often a reason that people have really fuzzy like bumpy looking work out little dots where the paint's not going in all the way it's the canvas it's not even you it's the canvas is not smooth enough for the techniques you're trying to do okay so <laughs> Rob says, I've never been so invested in someone else's pups, but I just love Wade. Yeah, bad cow is a bad cow. Baddest of cows. Um, Gibson's like, but I'm the best boy. Don't get enough love, huh? Okay, moving on. Focus, Lisa. So the first thing we need to do is just get our background in. And what I'm going to do is fade from that blue down to the sand color. I'm not going to worry too much about the middle just yet. 
this is, hold on just a second, this is bending weird. Let's just take my cardboard and try to get it to lean. That is not doing what I wanted it to do. Why are you leaning weird? Well, I'm going to have to deal with that. Okay. I also have some new merch to show you that I got. <laughs> How funny. Rick says, um, Rick sends another super chat, said, can't have the boys getting skinny now. Do you hear that? Do you boys want another super chat? So we do. Look at how starved we are. We lost weight. We're greyhounds, and greyhounds can't lose weight. I mean, I don't know. I'm just assuming because I see more ribs than I'd like to see. Here you go. Extra treats. So many tasties, huh? Thank you so much, Rick. Um, oh, my volume. Hold on. I can fix that. Thank you. That is something that I do have control over. There. That should be better. I always forget to transition when I switch computers. Okay, go lay down. Do, do not give sad cow eyes. Go lay down. All the way down. Gibson, lay down. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. So, yeah, that's um, when I switch the mic. The, yes, it's because the different computer. Um, let's see. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put out new white just because this white, even though it looks like there's white on there, it's kind of dry. So while, once I start painting, I don't have to, time to mess with if that's too wet or dry. I'm going to need, oh, where is my black? I may not have that out right now. Oh, no, I just stuck my hand in wet paint. That's how you know I'm a real artist, right? Um, hold on. Where is my black paint? I have paint in like three piles in my studio. I really need to go through and organize everything. Um, I had it out last week, so it can't have gone too far. And I was really excited because it was a big tube and I didn't know I had a full tube. I mean, I remember the excitement. I just don't remember where I put it. Hold on. We'll get started in just a second here. I'm apparently trying to see how much time I can waste. Well, heck. And I've got multiple tubes of it, so one of them's bound to turn what? Turn up sooner or later. Let's see if I've got one in here. Um, nope, that's purple. Oh, what in the world? Did I seriously lose all of the black paint? Okay, it's got to be over there then. See, this is what happens because I've been working in colored pencil all week. So I start moving stuff out of the way that I'm not currently using. And I don't remember where I put it. And oddly enough, this room's not that messy. It sh I shouldn't be losing entire tubes of paint. Um, hmm. And it's not like I can really get around this. I need to gray that up. I guess I could use another brand if I have to. But my charcoal pencil then won't stick as well. Well... Here, I'll look around while I put out other paint. So I'm using phthalo blue. I didn't even get my phthalo green out. So, oh my God, I'm so not ready. I'm sorry, guys. What a mess I am tonight. Uh, I don't need that. I don't, yes, I do need, I'm gonna put a bit of dioxazine purple for the sky, not too much. So now I need black and <laughs> phthalo green. The phthalo green's probably easier to find. Okay, give me one second. I need to figure out if it fell behind the easel. Nope, not there, not there, not there. And here, I seriously thought I was prepared tonight. Um, I found one. Okay, this one will work. So now I just need my phthalo green. I may just use hooker's green and call it good enough. Because as we all know, color is not that big of a deal. Well, I'm using doing enough teal. Maybe I do want to get phthalo green tonight. The way that I mix my teal is 50% phthalo, there it is, 50% phthalo green and 50 phthalo blue. Okay, I've got my colors. So sorry about that. Here, oh good, it's Mars black too and not lamp black. 
I would have just ran with it though if it was lamp black. Okay, so I'm going to use the, I'm out of breath now because I'm out of shape. Uh, there's some Mars black and I did put phthalo blue. Yep, and now I need phthalo green. That is way more than I need, but okay, whatever. Okay, look, it's 11 minutes in and I am just now getting started. So I'm gonna use, this one is a number 12 filbert. This is just a generic um, Teflon bristled filbert. And I like the Teflon bristled versus a flat because I have softer start and stop points with my brush. Uh, let me make sure I've got a few mop brushes. I'm going to be blending out my brush strokes with powder brushes. So I call them mop brushes, but really they're just powder brushes, makeup brushes. And you want something super soft, I use these versus a mop brush because these are not gonna shed like a normal paintbrush mop brush would. And okay. So I'm gonna start with the sky. What I'm gonna do is fade from purple to oxygen purple. I'm gonna start pulling in my blue. I'm gonna rinse my brush and then I'm going to switch into phthalo blue and phthalo green mixture and then down into my sandy color, which is gonna be my uh, raw, uh, raw sienna mixed with black and white to give me kind of a grayish sandy color. And I've got my fine mist sprayer. This is how I keep my paint wet for as long as I need. So if it starts to dry, it doesn't matter. I've got this. this, this will fix it. Now one of the things that I see beginners do a lot is fuss over different retard, retardy, retard, uh, slow dry mediums, retardy, retard mediums. And all of that is sounding super offensive as I say it, and that's not what it is. Whatever, it's a slow dry medium. I hate them. They make the paint gunky. You're, I've never seen someone use one of those and me think, hey, I want my artwork to look like that. Just use water, just a fine mist sprayer lightly, or if you have an airbrush, you can airbrush uh, water, just fine, fine mist. And let's go ahead. I'm going to start, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and mix my phthalo blue and phthalo green so I get my teal color, kind of a more of a blue for when I get to that stage. I've already got some mixed. Okay, and I'm going to wipe that brush off get paint all over my hand. My mix for brown fran is my red oxide and black. Okay, so I'm gonna start with purple and my blue. This basically just makes it kind of an ultramarine blue. And I'm gonna start up top and I'm gonna plan on doing this in two layers. So if my first layer is streaky, I don't even care because I'm gonna go right back over it. This is just mapping out about where I want stuff to go. And as I move my way down, I will use less purple and more blue, just so I get a little bit of a transition there. And if you've got my reference photo, the link is in the video description if you don't have it. That's just a quick digital painting so that you can tell about what colors I'm going for. I'm going to make sure this stays wet. So I've got my fine mist sprayer, a little bit of a mist there. I'm gonna pull a teeny bit of white at the bottom and let that blend up. So I get this pretty transition up into my darker colors. And I want a bit more purple up here. And purple's pretty translucent, so that's gonna be really streaky until I do my second coat, just cause I'm fighting against the white essentially right now. I'm gonna wipe my brush on my paper towel. And now I'm going to start coming in with my phthalo blue and phthalo green mix. I'm gonna mix a little bit of white in with that, just to lighten it up. I'm not at all worried about where that wave's gonna go just yet. I want my transition from the water into the sky to be so basically seamless. I don't wanna deal with a line. A Little bit of white in there with that again. I'm gonna pull some more white right towards the bottom where we start going into the sand. I'm gonna lighten that up a lot. Okay, now I'm gonna rinse this brush. I'm gonna use the same brush, so I'll just rinse that off. Yes, my camera la is always laggy for the, the easel. I apologize, nothing I can do about it. It's an ongoing fight I've had for the last year and I've not fixed, I, I upgraded the computer, I upgraded everything. Can't fix it. Upgraded the cameras. Okay. It's still, yeah, it's, it is what it is. Don't you hate when people say that? 
Okay, so I'm mixing a little bit of black, a little bit of white, and then my raw sienna. So whenever you have a color and it's kind of a, like a grayish color, you know right there, black and white, and then your color. So this is gonna be my sand color. And I'm just gonna fill that in, and I'm running that right up against the water. If I get too much blue, I'm just gonna wipe that brush off and reload it with the sand color. And now while that's still wet, I'm going to go ahead and take one of my mop brushes and I'll start with the light down here. We'll just blend that out and I'll wipe that onto a paper towel because it does start to pick up a little bit of paint. I'll just wipe that, any paint that came up there. And I'm not blending. I also often call it blending it out, but what I'm doing is getting rid of my brush strokes or at least most of them. Oh, I thought I was gonna do this in a second coat. Looks like I'm not. That actually is fine how it is. Huh, so I would plan if yours is really streaky and you don't like how it looks, do a second coat. Just repaint what you just did. It's just that I don't need to. It actually looks how I wanted it to, coat one. So I'm not going to do that. Um, surprise, <laughs> hey, look, that saved me time after losing paint. It took me faster to paint that than it did to find the paint that I needed. Seriously, I need to organize my studio. Okay. And now I've lost the paper towels. There they are. Now, the reason that I talked about drying this and then doing a second layer is that I'm fighting against the white of the canvas. And so you're more likely to have a very streaky look. Do one layer, dry it, do another layer. Don't even, don't work, I mean, get rid of the streaks as much as possible, but that's gonna help you with having good color saturation. Everything's going to go really light. It's just usually more smooth when it does that. My link in the video description for the Frederick's canvas doesn't work. Oh, well, sorry. I'll have to look into that for future ones. Thank you, Amazon, for continuously changing your links. Okay, I need a trash can in here somewhere, I guess. I don't wanna, that's gonna have to work. Okay. So now I need to dry this. But again, if yours is a little bit streaky, do another coat, don't worry about it. I have to use the hair dryer first on my easel because I've been working in colored pencils so there might be colored pencil bits all over. If you have any questions, leave those now. I'll be answering those at the end of the live stream. Okay, this needs to be completely dry before we move on. If it's not, when I go and put the second layer, even though it's dry to the touch, if it was still not really dried all the way, I put the second layer on, it'll pull off that first layer. Or if you're using a really crappy brand of paint, it'll pull off either way. So in, in your case, you, you guys are just screwed. So no, I, I've got nothing for you there. But for the Liquitex, I'm using Liquitex Basics. That's not something I have to worry about. So let's go ahead and clean that brush off. Now your paint water can be basically mud. It can be super dirty and it will not affect the colors of your paint. There is a video out there giving like top five or 10, I don't even know, acrylic painting tips. And most of those tips are actually for, well, several of them for other mediums. Like that one is a watercolor tip. Have a separate paint jar for your brushes versus mixing the paint versus color, uh, cleaning the brushes. Yeah, that's all BS. Um, that video just makes crap up. That guy just makes crap up all the time anyway. Um, so yeah, that's a watercolor thing. That's not an acrylic painting thing. Your water can be mud and it will not affect the colors of the acrylic paintings. Again, it's a watercolor thing. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, 
I'm just waiting to make sure I need that to cool off too. So this, let's see, let me go ahead and get a white charcoal pencil. So I don't want to use a regular graphite pencil one. It's not really going to show up, but then oddly enough, when you start to paint over it, it shows up through the other layers of paint. It's so annoying. Avoid graphite. If you have to use graphite, use a water soluble graphite, because at least that'll kind of work its way out. But graphite on its own never really erases all the way. You can, you can usually see it. White charcoal pencil. This one is a general's white charcoal pencil. This is what I use for everything. This is what I'm going to do to figure out about where I want my water to be. I don't need it exact to what my photo is. Well, this will be my sea foam area. And my little wave. This will be where it splashes up. And then the rest of this will paint in details there. Okay. So we have <laughs> Oreo Beagle one, apparently wants to help you guys gain a little bit more weight because mom gave you the wrong look. Apparently, they're not even low calorie treats. I don't even understand why. Do you boys want a super chat? Thank you so much, Oreo Beagle. Oh my gosh, this does sound very tasty. Do you have the chatters, Gibson? I don't know if you can see, Gibson's got chatter tea first. Got the chatters? Yeah, you can't really see, huh? When he gets the chatters, when he, you just drilled on me, when he gets super excited, his whole head vibrates. He gets such crazy chatters. I need to, I've posted it before on, on stories and stuff. I need to post more of that, it's funny. Okay, go lay down. Thank you so much. Lay down. Good boys. Did you get it stuck in your teeth? Speaking of chatter teethers. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do, I wanna create stars and I wanna create the look of sand. Now that I know about where those are gonna go, I know where I wanna spray the paint. If I accidentally get stars in the water, it doesn't even matter, it'll just look like paint sparkles. So we don't even care about that. Um, I need a fairly stiff brush. This one looks pretty good. And this is just your cheapy round brush. It came in a whole set, like with a canvas brush holder, but it's stiff enough that it works well for flicking paint. And I need a palette knife, if I have one. I can use the back of a brush if I need to. You technically use your hands, but it makes a huge mess. Apparently I've lost my palette knife, so that may be out. Huh. It should be in here. I'm not going to waste too much more time looking for that though. I do want a slightly larger brush for flicking paint. Let me see if I got something down here. Yeah, it'll work. Although I am wondering where that palette knife went. Huh. We'll just use the back of another brush or something. That's so weird because I usually put it, that's something I normally put away. Guess not today. Okay, so I'm going to start with white and okay, I'll start with the stars. So I'm going to get some white paint and I have to thin that down with some water. I don't want this to be too, that is not in focus. Let me fix that. Um, configure. Why must you always default to autofocus? It doesn't work. There we go. So I've got a decent amount of water mixed in with that. If it's too, th if the paint is too thick, this isn't gonna work. And then of course too watery would be an issue too because we don't want it to run. And take your palette knife, or in my case, I'm just gonna take the back of a second brush and I'm just going to flick this. I like a palette knife because it gives you a bit more control. But lightly flicking stars. And then I'm gonna pull it back and do some big flicks to get some thicker stars. Now here, it's getting a little crazy down towards the bottom. I'm just gonna take a clean brush and some water and smooth that out. And if a little shows, it'll just be sparkles, so it's not a big deal. Now I'm going, oh, getting paint all over my phone is what I'm doing. That doesn't belong there. I have a mess tonight. I'll just wipe that off and move this somewhere else. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I wanna get some sand, and the sand's going to be done in a couple of layers. One will be with white, 
And I'm doing little flicks because I want this to be teeny tiny little sands. I don't want it to be as big as the stars. So little flicks, I'm a little bit closer. Make sure you're pulling the second brush or palette knife, ideally, if that's what you can find, <laughs> unlike me. Pull it towards you. If you push it, the brush away from you, you will flick yourself in the face with all these sand and stars. You don't want to do this in just one layer. I'm going to do it in a couple. So the stars, I'll go through and do a medium blue. And then the sand, I'll come through with a darker brown. And let's go ahead, I'll just pull some blue into this. And it just gives me a little bit more depth. Plus I want a really starry night. Okay, now I'm gonna rinse that. Now if this brush gets to where it's too wet, you've rinsed it too many times, it starts getting really saturated, it starts getting very floppy, and it's not going to flick well. So switch to a clean, dry brush if you need to. This one should still be okay. And I'm gonna mix some black in with my raw sienna. Too much black, let's actually pull a little bit of purple in there. I just need it to be a dark, muddy brown color. It does not need to be a perfect color of anything. It just needs to be dark. Now that's another thing I wanna bring up. So I've been in this, reading comments and stuff in this beginner acrylic painting group. Lord, the bad advice in that group is painful. But everyone, and I talk about this all the time, it's just normal with beginners, they're so worried. What color should I paint this? What color is this? What color is skin? What color is this color of a dog? Six is my answer. Like at least six colors are involved in what you're asking and not mixing one solid color. It's all about mixing um, all of your values, all of your shading in there. It's never just one color unless you're trying to paint a cartoon. So everyone gets so worked up. If I just knew the color, what color for this? What color for that? The color doesn't matter. Worry about your values. And if you're in a place where you find yourself super fu like really fussing over color, start doing some black and white pieces so you get a better understanding of, you can do this in charcoal. You don't need to go buy all new materials. Just do some stuff in black and white or graphite where it starts forcing you to understand your values because that's really the one of the biggest problems that a lot of artists are facing is understanding values. It's, it's safer, it feels safer to do everything mid-range, like middle of the day. No, do get those darks darker, get those lights lighter. It's gonna make a way bigger difference in your work. Okay, says make a black with blue and brown. I don't use brown. I actually make brown with black and red oxide, so I don't need to do that. There are a million different ways to do that. A lot of people have this thing against black too. Um, everyone, actually I saw that in this beginner group too. Everyone was trying to, how to, how to make um, black or how to, how to paint without using black or something like that. The black is not the problem in these paintings. The use of black is fine. It's the values, like everything else. You can use black just fine. Um, there is nothing wrong with using black paint. What happens, and I'm seeing this a lot with the beginner lessons, they hear, like the, the teachers themselves are usually beginners, and they'll hear a bit of advice that, yeah, that advice, like they kind of take it a bit out of context or they take it too far. They take some like one tip and run with it to a point where it's like, that's not really what the intention was with that tip. So um, there is no, you can certainly use, um, the, I mean, there's 20 different ways to get, brown. There's 20 different ways to get to just most of these colors. So anyway, point is don't work yourself up too much about the colors. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Work, if you want to work yourself up over something, work yourself up over the values. Are your dark dark enough? Your light's light enough. This brown that I mixed, I could have used Van Dyke brown. No one would notice the difference. I could have used red oxide and black mixed together. No one would notice the difference. I could have mixed purple and yellow. No one would have noticed the difference. It, it's about the values. Are my darks dark enough?
Okay, now we can start in on the wave. Now, what I'm gonna start with is this point here. I want that to be where the light is coming from behind. I don't really have a light source on here. Let's pretend the moon is off to the side. Um, but we're gonna do light and fade down into a much darker area, especially darker under where the sea foam is going to be in this area here. So I'm going to grab, I have one here that works okay. This is another Tackle Ombre Sold. Filbert, super cheap. What is it listed as? Worrison? Wor I don't even know what that says. I don't know, some cheap thing I got off Amazon. And what I'm going to do is take a bit of white and I'm gonna go back to that teal color. But I need more white than that. The color we mixed earlier, I'm just gonna add white to that. A little bit more white. Get this cold off, right? Yeah. Nope, a lot more. That is not dark enough or light enough. I'm gonna actually mix in a fresh batch. So what happened? Actually, let me show you this. When I started mixing here, that color looks fine until I got my painting and realized that's way too close to what it was. If I keep stirring white into this pile, I am never gonna get it light enough. So I'm gonna make a separate batch over here with a little bit less paint. I'm just gonna mix it off to the side until I get it where I want it to be. If I just keep mixing there, I'm just gonna keep mixing a whole, I'm gonna end up wasting a lot of paint is what I'm gonna do. So add a little bit of water to that. And now I need that to stay wet, so I'm going to lightly mist that with my spray bottle. I'm gonna pull a little bit of white, the light here, and I'm gonna wipe that brush off and I'm gonna reload it with some of the darker color that I previously mixed and blend those into each other. Just very lightly, don't have to push very hard. Now while that's still wet, I'm gonna take a mop brush and just smooth that out a little bit, pulling it down. See how I got some little lines up here? I don't care, I'm gonna turn that into sea foam later. I don't even need to fix that. But if I did wanna fix it, I could take a damp brush with water and it'll work like an eraser and remove it. But for my purposes, no need to do that. So even a little bit darker. And it doesn't have to be perfectly smooth because we're gonna be adding lines in here anyway. Now I'm gonna start pulling. I'm gonna actually rinse that brush off. Again, with the phalo blue and phalo green, but this time I'm going to pull a little bit of black into that. Not too much. I wanna get this really dark. I need more water that's starting to dry on me. Just a light mist with my spray bottle. Now, because I'm blending, see how this is wet? This is dry. I need a, I mean, whoops, that's actually too stiff. Oh, because that was one of my stiff brushes. Never mind, that didn't work. Throw paint back over it. It started pulling paint off. Wrong thing. I'll use a different technique then. We'll just pull a little bit more water. And I'm going to blend that with my mop brush. So now we've got this gradient coming down and let's go ahead and dry that or yeah, dry that. I'm going to rinse my brush out and dry it. And I'll show you what this looks like in this camera because this one's actually more accurate with the color and such. That's an interesting question. Python said, I really use black. I've been mixing ultramarine blue and burnt umber for my black because it seems to have more depth, at least for oils in my experience. Have you noticed any difference? Depends on what you're doing. Um, I am going to do so many layers and so many glazes that everything's fairly translucent, so it makes no difference at all if I do one over the, over the other. But it depends on what w the overall piece. Like, there's no one right answer to anything. No matter, like, all the times you guys hear me talk about how dry brushing is such a crap technique, most of the time it is. 
Occasionally it's, it's the right answer though. Like there's never one, like an always go-to answer for something. I use web for when it comes to oil paint, I use Weber's Permalba Black. That is the darkest black. It is amazing, but I do a lot of glazing. So I'm glazing color on top of that, which is gonna give me more of that depth that you're getting. Mine, I'm just not having to mix paint. So, but like you put two, let's say I did one version of a painting where I was only using ultramarine blue and black and uh, Burn Umber, Raw Umber, what, did, what were you using? You're using Burn Umber. And say I'm using that for my black. And that does mix black. There's nothing wrong with doing that and it looks good. Let's say you did that versus I, or I, we'll use me as being the same artist for both. So I did both, one with that method, one with, with just black. The average viewer is gonna come up and look at them and not be able to tell a difference. It is, it's just not that big of a difference that most people are gonna notice. So, it's really gonna come down to personal preference. Uh, Eric said, love your work and the doggies. Thank you so much. Oh, this is a good time too, because I'm letting that set for a second. You boys want a super chat? Thank you so much, Eric. The boys thank you too. There you go, go boys. It's very tasty, huh? Did you just spit that out on the floor? Don't make, don't crunch all over the floor, Gibson. He likes to take a cookie. I usually don't like to buy the crunchy ones because he crunches it into a million pieces and then eats them individually off the floor instead of just chewing it and swallowing it like a normal animal. This is one case where Wade is, the bad cow is the normal dog. Okay, go lay down, go boys. Thank you so much, Eric. Cow, Gibson, you, we're not just gonna stand there. Go lay down, go on. Beggars. Okay. Oh, and I wanted to show you where we're at color-wise. It's actually not that different. Um, the sand is obviously a little bit softer. The stars are a little bit softer than what you see on that camera, but that's where I'm at right now. Okay. Oh, let's center that a little bit better. Okay. Next, I need to get this area here. So I am going to take a little bit of my light color and curve this around. And I'm gonna let it be a bit streaky for the wave crashing. And then I'm gonna do the same from the bottom coming up with a darker darker color. I'm gonna actually pull from that black again. And I just dabbed that on my paper towel so it wasn't too much. And I'm gonna pull that from the bottom up and I'm gonna let it follow. It has to be curved. See how I'm following this rounded area? This helps it to look like the wave is crashing over. Don't do straight lines. You do straight lines and you just made a flat, weird cartoon looking thing. Yeah, uh, Python said, thank you for answering that. I've seen plenty of professionals who mix black from either blue and brown or green and magenta for depth. You can do any. I mean, if you like the look, art is such a personal thing. I wouldn't say one is necessarily better than the other. It's personal preference. I don't really care one way or another in my own work. It's not what is going to make or break one of my pieces. So it, it's, uh, and I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong either because theirs probably looks absolutely amazing. And there are times that that is the better call. Like that black would not be the way to go at all. But it, it just depends, like everything just depends. There's so many factors. Okay, so that I put on light enough. I don't really have to worry about that. Uh, being wet. I do need to come though and start getting the hint of a little bit of waves and a little bit of movement here. So I'm going to still use, this is a tack lumber sole filbert, so we'll use that guy. And I'm going to take my medium teal again. And I'm going to mist a little bit of water here so that my, my brush strokes are going to go on very smooth. I need a little bit lighter than that. I've got too much water. I'm gonna actually fan that a little bit. There we go. I want this to just be nice and smooth. And mostly it's horizontal lines. Now this is a mistake I see a lot of uh, newer people make is that they do a lot of vertical lines. When you're doing the ocean, even if it's kind of bumpy, you're typically going to be doing flat, long horizontal, short diagonal, long horizontal, short diagonal. And that is the movement that I'm doing as I move my way through here. Long horizontal, short diagonal. Get that stuck in your head because this is going to, and it needs to be horizontal parallel to, unless it's like a big wave area, you want that parallel to the top or bottom of the canvas. You don't want to come at an angle like this or your water looks like it's sloping down. 
This is true if you're doing a pond, a lake, a river, anything with water. When you do these sorts of ripples, you want to keep it, for, most of them are going to be very flat, very parallel to the top and bottom of the canvas. And see, this is very, very subtle. I'll build up hot, lighter areas on top of this. As it dries, it won't sh show up as much. And this is another thing I'm seeing beginners very confused about. They think that their color is shifting. Teal colors do get darker. That's the only color I work with that I have, no matter what brand I use, seems to get darker when it dries. But for the most, not really with oil paints though, but with when it comes to acrylics, what happens is right now it looks brighter because it's wet and the, the lights above me are reflecting and catching in that wet paint when it dries. It just, it's not catching all of the white. You're not getting all those little teeny tiny heart, highlights basically. So when it dries though, I will go back over this with a, a um, high gloss varnish and it makes it look just like it did when it was wet. Now I want to do this in a few layers so that I get some that are a little bit lighter, some that are a little bit darker. So like that has a little bit more white mixed in with it. And I don't know what music is playing. Oh, huh, that is Amberlynn. I don't know this song, not a fan. And that brush stroke right there was way too heavy. All I'm gonna do is take a clean brush with a little bit of water, and I'm just gonna pull it out. I can either erase it by putting more water and pulling that up, or in my case, I'm just gonna work it in by making, see, I'm just pulling that out. My paint is a little too thick on the brush, that's why it's coming out heavy, but it's okay if a few of these are, that gives me variation. And that's, I'm just gonna wipe some paint off the brush. That's one of the things you want too when you're creating anything where it's supposed to be, look like, na like natural, you want variation. I don't want every one of these brush strokes the same. I need different width, I need different lengths, everything needs variation. And as I move up into this area, it's gonna curve up and come down. It'll curve and flatten. I'll use a different brush as I get further in there though. I'm liking how that looks. Okay, next, I'm gonna do, do I wanna do the sea foam now? Yes. I'm gonna do the sea foam now, part of the sea foam now, because I wanna let that dry all the way when I start glazing. So we'll do the sea foam, come back and do detail, and then go back and do the glazing on the sea foam so it doesn't look like flat white. That is the plan. I'm still looking for that palette knife. I know it's over here. It is just hiding from me. Okay, so there's a few ways we can do sea foam. One is to take a stiff brush like we did with um, the stars. I can use that same brush. I'm gonna dab, same thing, water down my white paint. I'm gonna put a little bit of blue in there. And I'm going, let's see if I can zoom this in a bit for you. I'm gonna put the brush here and push up just a little bit. Don't just stab at it. Stabbing at paintings, and I, I know I said that there's no definite rule. Stabbing at your painting is almost never the answer unless you're doing toll painting. That's not gonna look like real art. So no stabbing the canvas. Keep that violence for something else. See how I'm pushing, I'm touching, push up, let it roll up. Touch, let it roll up. And I'm gonna curve that around as it splashes up. And I want this in a few different little layers here. I, don't, I wanna make sure they don't all look the same and I want almost little round sections that come up higher. So it's not just one, you don't want this to look like one long worm. I want sections. And then as I get here, I'm just gonna lightly dab. I'm not really stabbing so much. See how I'm coming in and I'm down here. I'm using the side of the brush. You can use a smaller brush if that's more comfortable. And I'm just lightly tapping this on there. Don't stab it. No violence. And I'm just gonna pull that out and let it soften out. And I'll do it. And I'm going to lightly pull a little bit of this 
over, the, I want just a little bit of sea foam up here, little splashes. I'll come back and do highlights there in just a moment. Now these, I'm gonna pull sea foam. I guess I can do some now. Actually, it'll be easier. I'm trying to think what's the easiest way to explain this. We'll do that after. No, Sheila, that's a great question. Somebody brought that up in that beginner group I was talking about earlier too. Does adding water or drying with heat cause acrylic paint color to shift going darker? Not at all, no, not even a little bit. What is happening there? And this is actually a good thing to explain. Why people are thinking that is, you know how I talked about when I had water mixed in. The water is gonna make it look lighter because the way the light is bouncing off and reflecting off the water. When it dries, it doesn't have that to bounce off and reflect off of anymore. It's no longer reflective, especially if you're using a more matte finish like I am. These aren't matte, matte, but kind of close. So it when, when it dries, it looks like it went darker because you don't have that reflection hitting it anymore. And when you do that with a hair dryer, it happens so fast that you see it getting darker as it dries. If you let it air dry, it is going to be the same exact color. It changes nothing. So the only concern I have with using heat with acrylic paints is if you're using like a heat gun or although I did have a hair dryer that was malfunctioning once and I, because it didn't, would burn my head, I used it for art, but it would get too hot. If you get the acrylic paints too hot, and I'm talking heat gun hot, not your average besides the malfunctioning hair dryer um, level of heat that that would create, you can cause the paint to start to bubble because it's a it's plastic and it melts. And if you can imagine overheating plastic, what happens? So that is the only concern. It does not in any way change the color, but people they're associating the wrong thing. They're giving credit to the wrong thing as to why it looks darker. It's just because the water is no longer there. It's gonna get dark, look darker because of the lack of reflection when the water was no longer there, heat or no heat. So it just, it happens so fast with a hairdryer. They're like, it's, it's darkening before my eyes. Well, it would have the other way too. It would have just taken longer so it wouldn't have been as obvious. So that, that is why that happens. Okay. So let's go ahead. I am going to grab a round brush and I'm going to start blocking in where my little ripples and stuff are gonna go here. So I'm gonna use some uh, white. There's a little bit of my teal mixed in with it. Not because I'm trying to mix the perfect teal or anything there, it just is there and I'm lazy and I don't care because it doesn't matter for this. Uh, okay, so this is the same thing. Long horizontal, short diagonal as I kind of wiggle my way through here. And we've got to build up multiple rows, layers where this is building or moving forward. This getting this shape right can be a bit challenging. So this is why I provided the line drawing this time. Well, that and I don't have a definite reference photo. It takes some getting used to. But you just remember, long horizontal, short diagonal, long horizontal, short diagonal, long. If you keep that in your head as you move your way down, that is going to make a big difference for you. It's not wavy. That is never going to look good. That just gives you the super weird perspective. Never look like this. Or even if it's lower, that, it doesn't, that's not going to give you the same look. What we want, I may as well do it on this so it's more obvious. Long horizontal, short diagonal, long horizontal, short diagonal. This. That is very different than this. So that is what we're looking for. And I don't care if this isn't light enough, this is just kind of mapping out where these are gonna go. Yeah, that looks good for my rows. And we're going to have to start getting these in here as well. So again, I've got my white, it's mixed with a decent amount of water and some blue. And I'm gonna start pulling these veins and these are gonna be curved, I've got too much paint on there, and flatten out as we get down here. They have to flatten out. This is what makes it look like this wave is coming up and starting to tip over. Curve, flatten out and then give it some branches. And you want it flattening out at about the same area in here. So right around here. We're not flat here and then flat here and flat over here. We're not creating stairs. I'm gonna pull some of 
some more highlights while I've got this brush out. And I like to do this in multiple rows. So I've got this one being darker. I'm gonna switch over to a liner brush so I get some thinner lines, but I'm also gonna use more white. So the, this is my liner. This one's a number one. I actually prefer the number two, so it's a little bit longer here. When the brush, bristles are short like this, it's not quite as good. I can actually get better detail and longer brush strokes. I don't think I have a number two over here. Oh, oh, I do. So it's just a little bit longer, but that's really gonna make a difference. This is the number two is gonna give me a thinner line than the smaller brush. And I'm gonna take some white. And I've gotta thin that out with water and I'm just twisting that brush. So you can see this. I've loaded water in there and I'm just gonna twist that in there. If there's a chunk of paint on this or if the paint's too thick, that is not gonna give you fine details. And the harder you push, the thicker that line is going to be. I'm just going to touch my finger there where it's a little bit more bold than what I want. Some variation. See, I'm not just going over the other ones that I have. I'm making a separate grouping of these, but not as many with the brighter white. And this won't be quite as bright when it dries because, again, with the water that's mixed in there, it makes it look lighter. Long horizontal, short diagonal as I start putting these ripples in here. And they can connect. Now, if I do this and I realize, you know, I really like my lines, my white lines, but they're just standing out too much, I can glaze. So a lot of water, a little bit of paint. I can glaze a teal over them and tone them down. Oh, well, I shouldn't need to, but if, if that happens, it's an easy fix. Some more of those little lines up there that curve it over. You can see right now we've got this kind of focused right in here where most of our light areas are. I definitely want to pull that out. So I need to start adding some more out here. Long horizontal, short diagonal. Just keep that movement going. And all glazing is going to be, I don't usually use glazing medium. I actually don't really like it. Um, makes the paint kind of goopy and it dries fast. I use just a lot of water, a little bit of paint, but don't use white. You don't want titanium white because it's too opaque. That would not be a part of your glaze. If you need a color to be lighter, I would put, paint that area white first and then glaze the color on top that I wanted. So let's say I wanted a random like yellow balloon on here. If I paint yellow, it's not gonna show up. I would paint white and then paint that yellow on top. But when it comes to a glaze, just tinting the color, I could glaze yellow because it is translucent over this and it would just make, well, it would end up being green because it's going over the blue. But it just, think of it as like tinting your windows, just um, very, oh, that's curving more than I want. Um, very translucent. Okay, now each of these rows, these three rows we originally did, that sea foam is going to create a little bit of a shadow on the sand. So we're gonna give it a bit more depth by creating the shadow before we do the sea foam portion. And up here, I actually want to fill in, is there one more? Eh, we're probably okay. I'll just glaze over it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take two, I'm gonna do this with two different brushes. I'm going to take one of my smaller Teflon bristle filberts. This one will work. This one is another cheapy Amazon one. I'm gonna get it wet, but it needs to be a little bit damp. If it's too wet, it works like an eraser. So if it starts to erase the paint, just do it again and use less water on your, your blendy brush. Um, and I'm going to take the brown color. So I've got my purple and my raw sienna. So pretty much the same color I used for the brown and the sand. I'm gonna do this shadow with this. Thin that with a decent amount of water. And I'm going to pull this in here. And then I'm gonna take this brush and just pull it out. So this, I could pull it out a little bit further than that. 
just smudge that a little bit. Now the trick when you smudge with a second brush is not to overdo it. Couple brush strokes and stop. But already look how it looks like this water is raised up from the sand a bit, which will make more sense when we put the sea foam in. Right now it doesn't make a ton of sense why that would be lifted up off the sand, unless you're going for something super surreal, which gives you a very cool effect. Smudge that. This has to be smudged while it's still wet. That starts to dry. This is not going to give you the look you're going for. Okay, and I'm going to do the same thing on the other two. We're just going to pull this down. This is another area, that brown, it doesn't need to be the perfect brown. The color doesn't matter. Is it dark enough? That is what I care about. I'm just kind of smudging that little circles, pulling that out. And look how it starts looking more three-dimensional. A weird three-dimensional that doesn't make sense because we haven't put the thing causing the shadow in yet, but you get the idea. Smudge that again. And if this second brush isn't a little damp, it is not going to smudge well. Or if you're going too slow and this starts to dry, also not going to smudge well. Okay. What do I need to explain, Rob? Okay. What I'm going to do now is take a smaller flat brush. And this is pretty stiff. And I'm going to not so much, again, still not stabbing. I'm just going to lightly kind of tap this as I go by. Lightly is important. Do not stab at this. Glazing. Oh, what am I explaining about it? Did I not explain it? As, I probably messed it up. My messed it up. My, my brain is not here tonight. I am tired. And oh my gosh, I apologize. I'm going to take white. Yeah, glazing is just, a, not with white, because white's too opaque. You want to use a translucent color, so like yellows, orange, blues, and it just tints the color just a bit. And you'll see that because I'm going to do a little glazing over here later. So you will see that happen. But I'm going to take a bit of white, and I'm going to start tapping this. Turn it and twist it. This is our sea foam, and there is too much paint. I'm going to dab some of that off. I want this to be a bit more rough. Get some variation. Actually, pull this a little bit brighter in there too. If it's too bold, you just stick your finger in there, tone that down a little bit. Don't push very hard here. Again, no violence. See how I'm pulling some of this a little higher? Some of it stays flat. Get variation. We don't want this perfectly thin, same shape all the way through. That's going to look weird. Let some pull up. And again on this one. I know some of you are stabbing your canvases right now. I can hear it from here. There are screams involved. From the canvas, not you. Silent screams. Okay, so now that shadow makes way more sense under there. It's a little bit too bold here, so I'm going to tone that down by taking a little bit more white over that. And I can pull little highlights here. I'm going to just pull a little bit of highlighting, scraping that across there. Look at me doing the dry brushing I tell you not to do all the time. But it works because <laughs> this canvas is so smooth. It doesn't look like dry brushing. Dry brushing is a technique that is taught by beginners to other beginners of how to create like rays of light or shading and highlights. And yeah, it makes it look like a shadow, but it makes it look, it, it's a beginner's way to make a shadow. It doesn't look like a real shadow. So that's why you want to, you, you'll hear me complain about dry brushing a lot. 
Okay, I'm going to pull, I'm gonna dry this because I need to make sure that this is completely dry before I glaze. Otherwise, we're gonna have a bad time. bit and while that cools I'm gonna come down here and get some ripples in the water so I want to do the same thing as before I've got this kind of light teal color I'll do some in and then some with more white long horizontal short diagonal just like before and if you don't get this long horizontal short diagonal thing right in the beginning, do not feel bad. This seriously takes some practice. Get a graphite piece of, like a pencil and paper, scratch paper, and just practice getting those lines. But don't kick yourself if you're frustrated that it's not coming out right. That does, like it's totally normal for that to take a bit of practice to get, the, get used to, but do practice it. Very subtle little lines there. Now I'm going to come back through with some white. So I've got to thin that with water again. This one is a Simply Simmons. I love the Simply Simmons brushes, but this one is a number eight round. I like the Simply Simmons because they're a little bit more stiff than some of the other tackle and bristle brushes. They hold their shape real well. Now this is gonna get darker. It's not gonna stay so light once it dries because there's a lot of water mixed in there. So like we were talking about before, it's reflecting all the light from the lights above me. Once that dries, it'll be its more like natural self. Let's stick my finger in it because it was a little bit bold there line needed to calm itself down. That was an ask for your manager type line right there. And this is something that I see happen a lot too when people are trying to make these lines. They do a bunch of vertical. This is never, that, that perspective is never going to work out for you on, well, anything. So um, unless you're doing little ab worms floating, surreal worm drawing. Um, this, see how they're, they're wiggly, but they're long, horizontal, short, diagonal. You guys are going to go to sleep tonight and just hear long, horizontal, short, diagonal in your dreams. Okay, and now I can work on any values or any details I want. I want some extra sparkles in here. I'm going to put some individual little dots, little shine marks. So I've got thicker paint. I'm just using titanium white there. Getting some variation. Now, I don't like overdoing the white where you're dotting it in yourself, whether it be for stars, for sand. It's too easy to end up with something that is way too uniform. It, it just looks like polka dots. But come through and do a few individual ones for sparkles and stuff. That looks good. I'm gonna stick my finger in those and Soften that out. I think I want to pull more white in some of these. Not everywhere. I'm just working over what was already there. A lot of it you can't see anymore because I had so much water in it. Okay, now we needed to do that glazing, but I added white, so I have to dry it again. <laughs> so 
So for glazing, I'm going to go back to my tackle and bristle filbert and no white in this. I'm just going to take a bit of my phthalo blue, phthalo green, mix those together in a separate batch so no white is mixed in with it because I've got too much white over there. And I'm going to go right on the underside and I'm going to take that clean brush that had a little bit of water and I'm just going to smudge it up a bit, not a lot. Let's see if I can make this show up a little bit more. So the bottom, I'm adding a little bit of blue and then just pulling it up a little. I'm not covering all of the white. I'm just creating a little bit more of a shadow, a little bit more depth on the underside of some of the sea foam here. I can even pull a little bit of blue under some of these, adjust that shadow a little bit, pull that out. Just get some variation so it's not the same line going all the way through. A little bit over here. Okay, and do I want to do anything else? I want to add a little bit more of a shine on the water surface and then we'll be done. I'm going to show you how to sign your name. If you suck at signing your name and making it look like your name with paint, I'll show you a trick on how to make that work. So going back to what I said before about dry brushing looking terrible, this canvas is so smooth I can get away with it and it doesn't really look like dry brushing. It's not going to come out looking bumpy and terrible like dry brushing does. So again, that's a canvas issue and it's not like every Frederick's canvas is smooth. The watercolor canvas board, um, Bel Belgian linen acrylic primed and the Belgian or the uh, Bl Frederick's blue label, those are going to be your really smooth canvases. So I'm just going to pull a little bit over a couple spots so it looks like it's shiny. And done. Okay, how to sign your name. You're going to take that white charcoal pencil we used earlier and write it with that. We're not leaving it with that. Just start by writing that. Actually, do I want it there or there? Sometimes I'll sign up at the waterline too. Yeah, there's fine. So I'm just gonna, I can't write that right. Let me just put that on my lap for a second. So I've written my name, so it looks like my name. Make sure whenever you sign it, it's always up a little bit because this would be put in a frame and that frame will overlap just a bit. So make sure you're just up above that a touch. I'm gonna take the liner brush and I can take the teal colors or any of those colors we used earlier. And now I just trace it. And you're gonna do this in sections. One little section, lift the brush. Top section, lift the brush. If you try to do this in one movement, it is not gonna, you're not gonna have a good time. Things are going to go terrible. Twisting that paint into the, uh, or the brush with water into the paint. The paint's starting to dry on my palette a little bit, and so that's why I keep having to re-add water, but I don't want too much, because that makes a hot mess. I probably should just make a new little batch of paint, but whatever. Okay, and that is it. And I'm gonna take the hair dryer to it because I have enough water in there, I'm afraid it's gonna run. Good enough not to run. Okay, and don't erase. So right now I can still see my white lines where I use the charcoal pencil. Do not erase that right now. Wait till tomorrow because if you erase it now, there are always gonna be little spots that are still wet and you smudge the paint. It, it's just, 
it's frustrating. Um, one second, let me switch my music back. All right, let me show you what this looks like. And this one you can bid on. The link is in the video description. The starting bid is $70 if you want your own little seascape. So that guy came out looking, I'm really happy with that. Well, ocean, that's like my thing. So there we go. Again, that one is available for you. Now we have a bunch of questions to go through. And I actually had one question from that beginning art group that I had joined. Somebody had asked, and I talk about this a lot, but I want to go a little bit further into it because it's a little, it's a little bit, um, Oops, that's not it. It's under my drafts. There's paint all over my phone right now. Uh, drafts. So I had this question come in, or, or question from Molly from Lady Hawk Fine Art. She said, I would like you to help me with a question. I struggle with the idea of, do I paint what I want to paint or do I paint what I think my audience will buy? So our normal answer to that is paint what you love, it shows through your work. If you're painting something you're not interested in, that shows in your work. However, let's take that a little bit farther. Um, I'm gonna finish the question because there is more to it than simply that when you're a professional artist. Um, so more things to consider. She said, I live in a beach town and it seems like all anyone wants are mermaids, beach scenes, fish, etc. Although I love those subjects. Well, I, well, I have yet to do a mermaid, with, uh, I would show anyone. I just don't know if it's smarter to stick with what they want or do what I want. Not many people here are interested in big cats like tiger, snow scenes, etc. I'm in South Texas, by the way. What do you think? Paint what you love or paint what sells best? Also, it seems like all I hear people wanting are big canvases, behind the couch wall canvases. I don't always want to do large projects. You're So, okay. Again, my normal answer is paint what you love. But here's the thing. Sometimes as artists, we are going to do things that aren't our favorite thing in the world because we need to make money. I need to pay my bills. I enjoy doing beginner art lessons. They're not my passion. I enjoy doing wildlife or like, we'll use this as an example, a colleague that I'm working on right now in colored pencil. I'm enjoying this. He's gorgeous. Is my passion drawing pet portraits? No, I mean, I love them, I love animals, but is that my passion? No, but sometimes you gotta pay the bills. I needed a dog to do as a colored pencil lesson because that is what students have requested. I am going to sometimes do things that aren't my passion, even though, I mean, I still, just like you were saying, you, I think in another question that um, you were talking to somebody else and, and you were saying you like painting marine stuff, you just wanna do other stuff too. I like drawing dogs. Is that not being my passion? Does it mean my work suffers? Again, you tell me. That's freaking, no, that's my merch. That's coming out amazing. I'm super happy with where this is at that stage. That fur, you can touch. I can feel the softness in that. But it's not my passion, so why do it? Because I need to pay the bills. But the way that you look at it matters too. I'm, I can't just paint surrealism. If all I do are surrealism, which is my passion, if that is all I do, I lose students. I'm not going to, then I can't keep, then I can't keep painting the stuff I really want to paint because I have no money. I can't pay my bills. So you're going to end up as a professor, if you're doing this for a living, you are going to paint things that are not your passion. But I also, the way that you view the things that aren't your passion, so we'll say doing pet portraits, that's how I made my living as an artist for many, many years were, were doing portraits on um, people and pets. A lot of horses, a lot of dogs, a lot of people. That is not, you know, again, I like surrealism better, but painting those, drawing those, you go into it, enjoying it and knowing I am perfecting my skills. I am perfecting my realism. I am perfecting my details in this type of fur texture, in this type of lighting and, it, or am I blending? Whatever it is, every single piece you do is improving or it should be improving your skill level that much more. So now I can apply that to the things that I am true, you know, to the surrealism that I like so much. So what if I wanted a collie, a surreal collie, or I've done a surreal one with a lion and his mate, he's and his mane is coral and um, he's got fish swimming all around him. He, that guy, because I've done so many lions, just lions, normal basic lions, that's what students want, the basic stuff, not, some people do like surrealism, but the majority of my students prefer the, like, I just wanna draw a lion, I don't wanna draw a lion whose mane is coral, that makes no sense to me. But because I've done so many just lions, I'm really good at fur. I'm really good at lion fur. I knew how to then apply that to the thing that I was super excited to paint for myself. So it's never a waste to do the thing that in, 
your case, you're saying this is what would sell for me. Now, let's take that a little bit further though. We've got the internet and, and are you going by what people tell you or by what you've experienced? Because a lot of times what people tell you is going to sell, they don't know what they're talking about. It, they really don't. Like people talking about, oh, they only want big things to hang behind their couch. Most people don't want to pay for that. I paint a big painting that is big enough to go behind a couch. You're talking about five, $6,000 minimum. People don't want to pay that. So they may say, I want this big painting. Yeah, they want to spend a hundred bucks on it. $150, $200 on something that size. Are you willing to do something at those price points? So even though people will tell you they want certain things, doesn't mean they're going to buy it does not mean they're gonna pay for it. Unfortunately, when it comes to art, when it comes to large pieces that people are hanging on their wall, many of them are just gonna go and get that generic stuff that they used to, I don't know where they're start selling it now. It used to be sold outside of a, um, the grocery stores, like on the sidewalk. I think now you get them from like Hobby Lobby, the crap overproduced made in China crap art. That is what most people are gonna hang in their walls and those are the prices they expect to pay. So the idea that there's this huge demand out there for, for large paintings, but you don't like painting large paintings, there's not that big of a demand. It's not as big as what people are making it sound like because they're not willing to pay for it. Um, and then going back to, you said, with the marine stuff, that's, that seems like that's all that anyone wants. You need to find the right buyer. Because that's certainly not true. If you can find an art, er, an area, now I don't know how small your town is, but if you can find an area, like an artsy area, a lot of them have all kinds of stuff. And being in Texas, well, Texas is a whole other country on its own, but you can head north some and find galleries there that maybe they have cows, maybe they have more wildlife and they would be willing to, to display or sell your art. Now, I don't, I didn't look up your art because I don't want to see it. And then you think I'm like criticizing your art in any way because I genuinely don't know what it looks like right now. So we'll just go with common tips. It almost sounds in your post like you're talking from a, like you've not, really established a name for yourself or establish your art. Maybe you're in the beginning stages of your career. So again, I don't know, I didn't look, but on purpose, cause I don't want to come across and say something rude. I can't say anything rude cause I don't know what your, your artwork may be the best thing in the world, but is it there yet? A lot of times when we're starting out, you're gonna build a name for yourself based on your unique ideas. Um, if you're trying to paint the same thing, let's say you're earlier on in your career and you've sold, you're selling a couple paintings, maybe you sell one painting a month. You've not really probably built that big of a name for yourself that yet. So copying somebody else, you're like, oh, that person over there is selling a lot of paintings of dolphins and whales or ocean things, mermaids or whatever. Yeah, but they probably built a name for themselves doing that. There are, you know, you gotta market yourself. You got to get yourself in front of people. When I first started painting, I remember going to the beach. My big thing was always marine life. And I remember going down there when I was a teenager, I would draw these orcas and charcoal over color, uh, watercolor was my thing. So I was down at the beach and I saw this lady, she had, she was selling uh, marine life and she was selling them for, you know, $5,000 and they weren't very good. And I looked at that going, I'm going to be rich. Oh my gosh, I can do better than that because I was an idiot 19 year old girl, um, we're not so smart at that age, but, or not as smart as I thought I was, that wasn't how it worked. She built a name for herself. You can't, just copying what somebody else is doing isn't a guarantee that yours are gonna sell as well as theirs. They built a name for themselves and that name is largely what a lot of people are selling. So, you know, it depends on what it is. Um, Let's say, do you guys have Wild Birds Unlimited down there? Wild Birds Unlimited is a place, I know we have them up here, where it's a franchise of um, where you can go buy like wild bird seed and get bird feeders and stuff like that. But they also carry gifts. If you're doing wildlife, if you're doing birds, like hummingbirds, because the one that I go to has talked to me about wanting to sell my prints, if I ever get to it, I need to make prints of one of my hummingbird pieces. Um, they wanted to sell some of those in their shop. You just need to find the right place for what it is you enjoy creating. But again, when we're trying to make a living, sometimes we're gonna paint things that aren't our passion, but that doesn't mean we're not improving our work because of it, or that there's anything to feel bad about. I would rather do that than let's say I have to supplement my income going back to cleaning houses. I really don't wanna do that. I would rather paint portraits, do take some portrait commissions if I need to, or do beginner painting lessons, uh, because I know I can make money doing that, You know, building up a student list doing that. Is it my passion? No. Do I enjoy doing it because it's painting? I enjoy that a heck of a lot more than cleaning some person's toilet that doesn't know how to aim. So um, ask me how I know how that happens. Um, mm, old days of being a housekeeper. But anyway, the 
I don't think that there's anything wrong with painting something that you know is going to sell if you know it's going to sell but are you just making the assumption that that person's selling it so you think if you do the same thing it's going to sell for you not necessarily the case and it also you know your skill level how much have a name have you built for yourself and if you're at a place where you're like well I haven't built a name for myself I don't say that to bash you you're going to you got to you're going to put in the footwork it is hard being an artist is not just being an artist you're also going to be a marketer you're going to be a photographer because you've got to photograph your artwork you've got to be a photo editor because you've got to edit it to make it look just like the art you've got to be a business person you have to be a tax accountant you have to be an HR person you've got to be all the things so yeah sometimes you're going to be doing parts parts of being an artist aren't going to be your passion that doesn't mean that they're not worth doing or that you shouldn't attempt to do them but on the flip side let's say you're going into art and you just the world you can do anything the world is your clam the world is your ocean I don't know how sayings go, but you're gonna go it go, you can do choose whatever. We've got the internet, we can sell online. That said, on the internet, your competition is a bit on the higher end. So I mean, you've got well, I guess it would be in the galleries too. But if you're doing realism, and I'm not sure what style you're doing, but if you're doing realism, the you better be good. And if you're not amazing now, you can be, you just got to work towards that. But you're gonna to have to get many sales online. You've gotta be really, it, is, it can be hard. It, it certainly can be in, in many cases easier to sell a painting that somebody sees in person than it is online. Because there's just so, people are so overwhelmed by so many paintings that they see online. So yeah, we're not dependent on painting what we see locally. It sometimes can be easier to, you know, can you do both? That's, that I think is the ideal answer. Do some of the stuff that I know you said you actually do enjoy doing marine life. You just want to do other stuff too. Okay, some stuff you sell in the galleries down there. Some stuff you sell on your website online. Maybe you drive a couple hours north to more central Texas and sell, find somewhere that sells a lot of paintings of cows or wildlife. I mean, cows, it's Texas. We like our longhorns. Get some, get some other stuff in there. Um, farmhouse, so many people like the farmhouse decor, painting stuff that has cows, that has chickens, that has you know barn animals. That may do well if you do a few paintings like that and find a gallery that will work with you up north and you just, you know, once a month you go drop off a couple new paintings or whatever it is. But I think doing both is really helpful for me. Like I said, I've got to do some beginner stuff that it's not my passion, but it doesn't mean I don't enjoy doing it at the same time. Um, the idea that everything you paint is going to be what you're super passionate about is not realistic when you're trying to make a living. Oh, look, I just summed that up in one sentence. Why didn't I just say that? I rambled for a long time when I could have just said that. Okay, back to some questions here. Um, Rick said, silly question, but would it be at all possible to continue putting and blending colors on an unfinished acrylic painting that has dried? As long as you haven't varnished it, yeah. You can keep, you can keep doing, you can work over acrylic, like there's really no limit. Just keep layering. It may hit a point where you've got 800 layers and it is super smooth, so stuff's not sticking so well anymore, but you'd have to have a lot of thick layers to hit that point. Like painting where everything's been down like how I do, oh, you, you've got all, like you can keep on layering. There's no, I mean, that's essentially what I'm always doing. I just typically do it in a couple of weeks versus coming back a year later, but I could come back on an old, actually, here's a good example. I have a painting that I did, a big round painting. It's a snow leopard on the earth and the moon is sitting there. And I love this painting, except where I totally royally screwed it up because I have a tendency when I shade planets to go insanely dark. Why would I use black? That wouldn't even be a black shadow on this painting. I don't even know what, talk about when you shouldn't use black, sometimes I take it too far. And I did on that one. And I can't sell it because it's not good enough. So I'm going to, but the, the leopard is beautiful. The background is beautiful. It's the shading on the earth and the moon. I painted that like, I don't know, 2000, it was before Patreon. So maybe 2013, 2014, right around there. I don't know what year, some, somewhere back there. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to go back and repaint that earth and the moon. The rest of the painting is fine. As long as I didn't varnish it. And I didn't, thank God I didn't. I'm gonna go fix the thing I absolutely hate about that painting that I've always hated about that painting. And when I do that, I will it'll suddenly be instantly one of my favorite paintings and then I can actually sell it. So that, yeah, I'm gonna go over and, and fix something that I did years ago that I never really loved. And it's been sitting in the closet waiting for me to figure out what to do with it. And I'm just gonna repaint it. I am going to record the repainting it though, I think. No, I'll probably go fast enough. I probably won't put that on Patreon. Never mind, I'm rambling. Um, believe it or not, I have not had that much caffeine today. This is what happens when I get really tired. I think I start talking faster so I can go to bed sooner. Um, let's see. 
Aurora said, I'm not much of an internet person, but I'd like to get my art noticed online to help make sales. Every social media site I've looked into, I've heard complaints over. Have, have you any suggestions? Oh God, can you afford advertising? Because that's really the only way that you're gonna do anything worthwhile on Facebook or Instagram is if you're paying for ads. Unfortunately, it's a pay to play site now. Um, even if you wanna see stuff from your friends and family, you're probably, you'll see stuff from them occasionally, but mostly you see what people are willing to pay for. If you can't afford that, then I mean, and this is why you're seeing me now post more myself on, and maybe this will help some of you guys. This is why I've been posting more on Facebook because I'm running an ad. And if I run an ad and people go to my, to my page because they saw the ad, they need to see that I'm active and see current stuff. So I, it's forced me back onto Facebook as much as I dislike Facebook. So, um, and that's why I dislike Facebook. You don't see what you want to see. You only see what people are willing to pay to get in front of you. Uh, it sucks. Facebook is good at getting those posts in front of the right people. I, I know a lot of you have been seeing my ads because Facebook knows that is the sort of thing you'd be interested in. So they keep showing you my ads. But yeah, it's, it's, the world is my oyster. That's what it is. Thank you, Art by Emmy. <laughs> um, I always screw those up. But yeah, that is the downside of Facebook and Instagram. I am, I say YouTube, even as bad as YouTube is right now, being found on YouTube is very difficult. If you aren't reaching their top five, when somebody searches in how to paint an ocean, how to paint an ocean wave in acrylic paints, if I'm not re ranking number five, no one's gonna find it. You can't, you used to be able to scroll through lessons and it sucks as a user because you used to be able, like I wanted to look at some paintings done in oil pastels because I had just got my set. Well, it's been like a year now, but I wanted to look up some lessons on that. I, Facebook show, or not Facebook, YouTube shows me five and then suggested for you, also for you, related to your search. You used to be able to just search and search and like hundreds, you go to hundreds of pages of posts until you found something you were looking for. Not anymore. You can't, you cannot find what you're looking for on YouTube. But even given that, they're still the easiest way to get found. So if you're willing to do videos, that's a good way to go. My favorite is still MeWe. And I wish more people used it, but not enough people will break away from the addiction of Facebook. They're like, well, I won't go, my friends aren't there. If everyone just went there, so many of our problems would be solved because you see who you follow on MeWe. There are no ads and you see just what you follow. So that's a whole other rant, but post a lot. I mean, the more you get in front of people, the better and as much, they don't show your stuff. They show your stuff to less than 3% of your followers. That's insane. And I think it's lower than that now. It, it, it just keeps going down and it just gets to the point where if you won't pay, they won't show it to your followers. Well, what was the point of building followers? Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very frustrating, but some people are going to see it. So posting as much as you can there. And then if you can build a, a following on MeWe, that's great because when you post, anyone who's following you will see what you post on MeWe because we, MeWe is an actual like, it's made in a way that users like, like how, what we ask for, we want chronological order. We don't want an algorithm. MeWe has that. So if we could get everyone going over there, that would be amazing. Follow me on MeWe, by the way. So, um, you know, I don't really know the answer because right now it is a lot harder. The, the biggest tip I can give you, make better work, better art than everyone else, more interesting art. If you can get people liking, you can get people that are like, wow, that stands out from everybody else. If your art, you're just kind of, let's say you're your first three years of being an artist. I don't know where you're at, but let's say first three years. You're getting there. You're on your way to being amazing. You're just not there yet. You're gonna have a really hard time competing and getting anywhere, getting enough people to respond to that photo. People are so used to seeing the best of the best on social media that chances of seeing something that's not the best of the best but is still good is a lot less likely because it's not getting as much of a reaction from people. If it doesn't get a reaction, the algorithm is like, meh, people don't like it that much. I'm not gonna show it to more people. So it, it's a challenge all on its own. So get really good is my other advice. Do things that are creative and unique to you. If you, let's say you like Thomas Kin Kincaid, so you just keep painting Thomas Kincaid styles. That's not unique to you. There's nothing unique about that. What are you doing that makes you, that people look at it and go, wow, I haven't seen something like that before. Can you come up with something like that? Those posts, when I post surreal stuff, so as much as I say my um, people, like student wise, they prefer like, uh, portrait of a dog or a horse for a lesson or a seascape, something more basic for a lesson. But when it comes to social media, if I want interaction, if I want people to, to react and hit like, I've, I just did, it's behind me, an orca, or no, it's not an orca, it's a humpback whale swimming above a road. It looks like somewhere in the Northwest um, of the US. I guess I should put that part in. Um, 
he's swimming above a road. That got more reaction than most things because it's unique. It's one of those things where people stop and go, oh, that's cool. So it was very well done, one of my better pieces, and it's unique. And so that is a way to get more attention if you can create a lot of work like that as far as social media goes. Social media loves that sort of thing. Art students, however, they want some more, can you draw some roses? You know, some, th that's more common. But yeah, hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, can I talk more about glazing? So glazing is just tinting the color. I showed that on this piece where it just thinned down the color. So like blue with a lot of water and I glazed it over the white and it just tinted the color. So you can still see the white through it. You can still see what's underneath. I'm just tinting the color. Uh, Nadine said, in the sample you had blended all the flicks in the sand. Now you have left them as distinct dots of color. Yes, I did. Because the sample was a very, very quick uh, digital painting to make a sample. So, and it didn't look good. My, my sand was not as, as good. I like the flicks. This is how I typically do sand where it's um, more defined, little rocks and such. But let's say you wanted, you can bid on that right now, by the way, link is in the video description. If you wanted it blended out, I would have just kept all the sand wet with the spray bottle and then lightly gone over it with a mop brush. You can make yours blended and, and wet look. I guess that does look good, kind of wet, huh? I mean, you can do it. It's just, it was a difference of quick digital painting versus quick acrylic painting. I'm going to use different techniques. I didn't have a photograph reference photo to show you what we were going by. And I knew if I didn't have that, I needed something for people to look at for this lesson. Um, Kathy Davis said, I need to learn more about color mixing. I do colored pencil, pastel, and graphite charcoal, but <coughs> just getting started with acrylics. I'm not sure how you determine what color you would use or if the whole paint or if you do the whole painting versus just some areas. New to acrylics, I'm trying to understand better. Um, I'm trying to, I'm not sure I understand the thing. I'm not sure how to determine what color you would use. Okay, so this is what I keep going back to. The color's not a big deal. It just isn't. Do, I would say while you're getting used to, to acrylic paints and you've been used to working in black and white because you've done car, uh, graphite and charcoal, do some black and white acrylic paintings first. Understand how to blend and don't even worry about color. When it comes to color, it's not really, well, I guess it is a little bit different than colored pencil because we have such a massive collection there. Use less colors is my biggest tip I can give you. So I would say your first few paintings, just do some black and whites. They're stunning, they're beautiful. Everyone loves a good black and white painting. But on top of that, when you start mixing in color, I want you to use as, as few colors as possible. Pick one red, pick, I would say red, a yellow, blue, you can even throw in a purple dioxazine or a violet red because those two colors, even though you've got red and blue, if you don't have the right perfect red and blue, you're gonna get weird purples and magenta. So it's just easier to go ahead and grab a purple and magenta. So again, red, blue, yellow, either a purple dioxazine or a deep violet, white and black. Red, you, eh, you could go with red oxide if you wanna mix a brown, black, cause I like to mix red oxide and, and black to get brown. But if you wanna make it easier on yourself, you just buy yourself a brown. The only reason I don't use brown, like Van Dyke brown, I don't buy it anymore because it always dries in the tube before I get a chance to use it all. That color just always does. Um, but use less colors and mix from that. So let's say, notice um, I did not include green in that. I want you to, any green you need, mix it with your yellow and your blue. Let's say you mix your yellow and your blue and you're like, wow, this is too, it's like lime green, it's too, lime green, you're gonna learn, pull more blue in it to tone it down some. Or if it's too bold, you can throw even a little bit of purple and that's gonna help neutralize it a little bit. But you're gonna learn these color mixing things by doing it, by, you're forced to mix it because I didn't tell you to get green. I told you to mix it with whatever yellow and whatever blue you have. When you have fewer colors, you're gonna learn faster. One of the reasons I got so good at color mixing is when I started painting, I was so broke. I couldn't go and buy all the colors I wanted. I could only buy a few colors at a time and every week, you know, or not every week, whenever I got paid, I could go and buy another tube of paint. But that was expensive and more often than not, I wanted to buy canvas instead of more paint. So I just learned to mix from what few colors I had experience there. Um, don't You can get into reading color theory books, but if you're so early on that you're at the point where you're like, I just don't know what colors to choose. Color theory books are going to go, they're just gonna complicate things so much more. I usually don't recommend them for beginners. I think that they make things way harder than they need to be. Eventually, yeah, read color theory, That that's good, but it's not gonna make a ton of sense to you right now, and it, it's just, it complicates things. Every color theory book I've read makes things and words things in a way that it's not that they're wrong, they just make it way harder than it needs to be. 
get a simple basic set of colors like as few colors as possible do not run out and buy aqua and pink and orange and teal like don't buy all those colors learn how to mix it from what you've got on your palette it forces you to learn how to mix it so that is my tip there okay um let's see Nick says, what a perfect uh, segue for you to mention your Patreon channel and all the different tiers and rewards. You know, I thank you for that, Nick. And I actually, I'm going to come back to listing questions. I want to show you my merch as well, because um, that came in today. So for Patreon, if, if you want more lessons, beginner through advanced, and here's the thing, a lot of people, they feel like I'm a beginner, so I need beginner lessons. That is kind of like having the added, imagine you want to learn a new, a new language but the teacher will only speak baby talk to you. You're communicating, but it's not very good. If you want to get better, you've got to get somebody who speaks properly. And some of the words are going to be hard and you're not going to understand them at first, but that's how you learn. And it's the same thing with art. You don't want a teacher who nonstop teach or watch lessons and not even just a teacher. I mean, I do beginner ones. You don't want someone who's just speaking baby talk to you. We want to get you into those big words. We go, I want you to jump into some of the bigger projects that don't feel comfortable at first. It's going to feel too hard. You're not, your work is not going to look like mine when you're starting. But that's how you get it to look like mine. If you keep following beginner lesson after beginner lesson after beginner lesson, because you're like, I'm still a beginner. This is still what I need. You, your teacher's just taking, take, teaching baby talk to you forever. You're not going to get very far. So I want you to jump into some of the more difficult things. And that is what I offer. I have some beginner lessons, but I also am going to take you a lot further than that with your art. I've got lessons in all different mediums. There are over 400 available when you sign up. $4, no, I'm sorry, that changed. It, is, it isn't 19, or two, 1920. It's not 1920 either. I was going to say 2020, whatever. But um, for as little as $6 a month, you get access to all of those videos. That includes five reference photos a month that I have taken myself. It includes our daily sketch prompt, which I tried to post yesterday, but Patreon was being weird and wouldn't let me copy paste it. So I've got to get that for you guys. Hopefully it'll work tonight. Otherwise I'll be posting it in Discord for you. Um, it gives you access to our Discord group. You can post photos of your art, your sketchbook, what you're working on. Ask the other artists in our group for help if you need, if you're not sure what to go with or if you just want to show off something you're super proud of you can do that too or we have a group to share plants and our pets so you know there's that um for $11 a month. You get all of the that plus an additional five reference photos. You get access to our group challenge, which I've got to make a new one of. Um, you get access, what else do we have in that one? You get a new postcard each month. So your postcard is going to be like this and you get one of those a month. What else is in that tier? I don't remember. I'm missing stuff. $16 a month, all the same stuff. You get your postcard every month, even though I'm late and I just got stamps. Those are coming. Those are going out tomorrow. Gosh, that took, I don't know what, that's a whole thing, but whatever. Also, I've got new, more prints coming that I'll be op doing a box opening for you guys next week's live stream. I'm so excited. I can't wait. I just ordered four months worth of my Patreon stuff. Um, anyway, um, for that $16 a month, you get all of that. Plus you get, I don't remember. I don't remember what all it is. There's stuff. There's extra stuff. And then at 19 or no, 22 a month, you also get a mini print each month along with your postcard. It comes in an envelope. There's paint on my hand. You get an art sticker. This one says layer until it looks good. And it has my red eye tree frog glitch on it. Um, and some other stuff. And I don't remember all the rewards right now. So, you know, there's that. But the link is in the video description if you want to become a member. But again, for just $6 a month, you get access to all over 400 lessons and a new one. I, I used to say every single week, but I've been doing some more advanced stuff and they just take longer. So like the lesson I'm working on right now is over three hours long. So, and that's only part one, the Kali and colored pencil. So that is this one that I'm currently working on. Um, oops. I'm not hitting the right button and there we go. So that one, anyway, we'll come back to these questions and before, oh my gosh, my buttons push. I keep hitting it and it keeps double clicking for some reason. I've been having that problem with OBS all night. Um, I want to show you the merch and something that went wrong with one of the merch. I got my hoodies in this week. So I ordered the premium and the original whatever hoodies. And these ones, they're so cute. So this one is the premium hoodie. So here is the front. It's a little warm for me to wear it tonight. So it's got my magnolias on it. I don't know how well you can see that. I don't know, the link is in the video description if you wanna see it more clearly. And then the back 
has our artist definition, a magical creature that turns caffeine into masterpieces. Is that not like most of us? Um, so that hoodie, and I love it. It came out so nice. I ordered the, what is it, like their original, I don't know, classic. That's what it is, the classic hoodie. And they screwed up the print. And it came, and it was kind of faded. Actually, the front one's not as bad. It wasn't as bold as the other one, not just because it's red, but it was like, you can see the red through. So the flowers look pink because the red came through so badly. And I washed it, and it was bad on the, it was worse on the back. I washed it last night on cold. The letters are all coming off already, like one wash. It is falling apart. And you're thinking, oh my God, why would I buy it? Like it's just scraping off. This is why you buy it. Because I contacted Teespring, or they're just spring now. And, I'll, and I've had this happen before. It happens sometimes with sweatshirts that are printed like this. I showed them photos. They're sending me a new one. They offered I can either get a refund or a replacement. So send me a replacement. And I get to keep this one for free. So when this happens, I don't get mad at all because it, it just does. With this type of printing, it occasionally happens. You contact the company and their customer service is so good. It's always been great when I, I just show them a photo. They because they know what happens. It just it happens sometimes. Um, and I get to keep this. So this is now a painting sweatshirt. So I get a free sweatshirt. I mean, yeah, it's falling apart, but the sweatshirt itself is perfectly fine. Um, I know what it was supposed to say. So that is um let's move these somewhere. I don't know. I guess they're just going to stay there because I don't, don't want to get them dirty. Um, but anyway, I've got too much paint and stuff on the floor right now. Um, those are the sweatshirts. I'm super excited about it. I mean, I was kind of disappointed that the letters came off the one because now I was going to wear it. To, well, it's too hot tonight. But it's, yeah, um, no big deal. I just got a free sweatshirt. So uh, Teespring, that's why I use them. I used to sell sweatshirts and stuff out of Fine Art America. I don't anymore because their quality is crap and their customer service is crap. So when it comes to their prints, like framed the pillows, that is all fine. But the clothing, oh my God, no, I don't, eat. I took all that off and I use them because I know if you guys have a problem with them, they take care of you immediately, like right away they fix it. So that is my story about my merch. Oh, and one other thing, I got the sticker of Glitch. It looks so, it's a nice sticker too. I don't know where I'm gonna put it, but I'm super excited about it. So um, there we go. Okay, back to questions. As excited as I am about all that stuff. Uh, Lydia said, is there a difference between a flat paintbrush and a filbert? When and when would you use a flat brush and when would you use a filbert? That is a good question. So the difference of these, let me find them. Got two examples right here. Let's go back over here. Here's my filbert. You can see how that's rounded. Here's my flat. So what happens if you're using a flat, when I, my start and stop point, when I switch directions, flat line. Flat line, flat line, flat line. It's really, you end up fighting that a bit. So I don't like that. Whereas if I use, this one's wet, so I don't wanna rub that on the brush. When I'm using a filbert, so here's another one, rounded. When I'm lifting that or going back and forth, my start, being rounded, it just gives me a much, much softer transition when I'm switching brush strokes. Now I'm not holding the brush flat the whole time. I'm lifting. But even so, when I lift it with that flat brush, it's just a little too harsh. And I'm more likely to have a line where I switch directions. When I use a, and so for almost everything, filbert, almost everything, the exception is if I'm trying to do a straight line, then I, li I really like either an angled brush or a flat brush are great for that. So, but normally I am not a fan of flat brushes for very many things. Um, let's see. Cat's Art Pig said, how are Purple Frog and Captain Cookie doing? They are doing great. They are adorable and they were super loud the other night. Um, they were barking. Stephanie said, can you do a demo of how to use mixing white and titanium white? When would you use them? Would, uh, would I use mixing white to lighten my acrylic paintings? I don't know where my mixing white is right now and it would take me forever to find. So we saw how long it took me to find the black paint. Um, the transparent mixing white, that you're go you can use it in a glaze. It will lighten the color, but it doesn't make it opaque. So it like, uh, not as opaque as like titanium white is just opaque. You mix that and you get an instant, very, very pastel. Whereas the transparent mixing white, you can do it as a glaze. So let's say I wanted to do a highlight 
but I still want to see the dark lines. Like, let's say, let's use this as an, as an example. I wanted to put a highlight across this, but I don't want to lose all of that detail and all those lines. I could use my transparent mixing white, maybe mix a little blue in there with it, and then just glaze right over that. And it'll lighten it, but I can still see through it. If I do that with titanium white, it is going to be way too opaque, and I just have a white line going across. So that is kind of the easiest way to explain that. Uh, transparent mixing white, I like it. it. Let's say you want to paint rays of light coming through trees, coming through something like that. I really like transparent mixing white for that because it's much more subtle. Whereas if you use titanium white for that, it tends to look more foggy because it is more opaque. Even if you thin it with water, it still gets a, a bit of a foggy look. So normally transparent mixing white would be my go-to for that. Um, another time I would use transparent mixing white, an animal painting a shine on the eye. I will usually mix blue in with my tri my transparent mixing white and do that so I get this glossy look, this glossy light blue over the eye and that curve. And then I use my titanium white, which is again, the opaque for my brightest dot highlight that I want to, to like just be bold and bright. Um, so that would be my other, the other thing I can think of off the top of my head with you, what I would use one or the other for. Um, that needs a full demonstration video though. Python said, my only experience with Simply Simmons brushes are those spotter brushes that have the tiniest bit of bridges on them, not a replacement for a proper liner or rigger brush. I don't know if I've used that. Um, or if I did, I didn't realize it. JT said, should I be including my Patreon membership with you in my resume? <laughs> I mean, you could. <laughs> I don't know that anyone would care or know what that is. Um, Python said, uh, let's see. HomeSense sells those abstract pieces that use only colors that go with people's living rooms. It's sad to see actual abstract artists not sell anything while HomeSense making bank. Yep. Yeah, that, that is another one. Um, like TJ Maxx, all those places. You just get that cheap. Yeah, it does suck. People don't place enough value anymore on art, on buying original like art. They're not they used to get excited that they had a one of a kind thing. It was kind of a status thing. And now it's just this generic and that's just home decorating now. Anyway, everything is just, everyone has the same generic, whatever they found it like one of four stores. So you don't have a lot of like handmade stuff. Like I actually have, which is kind of cool. So I have some generic stuff cause that's where you, what you buy, but I've for furniture, but I've also got, what is it? The, the stand, the desk thing that dragon's tank is on behind me my coffee table and my coffee table, my dining room table. And is that it? One, two, three. And another that my entryway, like my entry hall has a little like nook. I have a table uh, stand thing there. And I had those all custom made by a local woodworker. They used reclaimed wood. I wanted this kind of old feel. The funny thing is it was cheaper than buying the mass produced stuff. Sometimes if you can find a local woodworker, you won't believe how cheap you can get stuff. Like it depends on what you want, obviously, but people don't realize they can get amazing one-of-a-kind pieces by contacting somebody local to do stuff. Um, I bought that stuff years ago. They've held up great. I love them all. Um, Dragon, the one that Dragon's on is a bit rickety, but that's kind of what I asked for. I wanted something that looked really old because of what I was using it for at the time. So yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sad. A lot of people I don't think, and I think the other thing is people don't even know where to get original art. People don't know what is good. They'll, and they'll go to a gallery and the gallery, because their markup is insane. I mean, a gallery is going to put what 50% on top of whatever you ask. So, you know, they're going to pay double to get it from a gallery. There's more to it than that. I know, but it, that's out of a lot of people's budget or heck, even mine, if people want something big. They're not going to pay five to $6,000 for a big, you know, behind huge painting. So yeah, it, people just don't value that so much now. I don't know why. Well, it's exp expensive. There we go. And yeah, let me just rant about the recession. Okay. Um, or inflation. You pick one. Uh, let's see. Art by MB said, approximately how many hours do you devote to your business a day a week? I'm just curious. All of them mostly. I mean, everything I do is kind of incorporated in my business. So like, even if I'm doing a water change on my fish tank, that's my office tank. Like it's part of my business. I'm posting on social media with it. It's in 
So I, I kind of count that. Um, it depends on what you include in your business. But when I get up in the mornings, like usually most mornings I get up and have to work for an hour or so on my Patreon video. I have to do that before the birds wake up. Otherwise you guys are going to hear chicken talking in the background or tuna talk, singing. So I spend about an hour every morning doing that. And then I have to go through any emails, which I am always behind. I'm always behind on everything. Um, let's say once a month, I need to spend a couple hours on Patreon postcards, three hours, usually with three hours once a month. I've got to put in every week, maybe on top of the videos, a couple of hours on Patreon, answering questions, figuring out what's wrong with somebody's membership. Like there's always something I'm working on. So add a couple more hours into that. Um, most nights, except for two, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I don't work on art. Most other nights of the week, I try to work on something, painting, drawing, anything. Um, those are my nighttime projects, but I've also got to manage editing videos. Like I'm working on the video of Dragon's Tank and that is hours. Although I'm determined to get that done this weekend, by the way, I don't, good, bad, whatever it's going up. So, um, hours when I'm working on a video, I mean, that is pretty much just nonstop from the time I get up until I go to sleep. It is just, oh my gosh. All of the hours I put into my business is my answer. I don't take days off. I take a half day off on Saturday usually because I go to the gluten-free bakery and get a cupcake. Um, highlight of my week, but, and a cookie. But let, let, let's not lie, Lisa, and sometimes a second cookie. I don't know why my pants don't fit. So yeah, that is my, my fun. I left the house once a week. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I can fit in walking the dogs more, so. It's warming up, so I've got to figure out how to like time that into everything. Yeah, all of the hours go into my business. Whenever you're doing something like that, well, especially when you've got a video, I mean, I'm rambling. I know, I'm, I'm so tired. Um, I've got to be a video editor. I've got to work, do the financial stuff. Like I've got to go do, go do my taxes. I've got to sort through every receipt that I have. I have to, I have to take care of my house. I've got to pull weeds. I really need to go pull weeds. Um, although I've been letting the dandelions go because dragon likes the flowers, but, um, yeah, there's just, I'm trying to think of all the things. There's just so much stuff on top of the art. It's, I'm just working pretty much all the time. I'm going to go with that as my answer all the time. Um, let's see. Why are my mouse, is my mouse dying? Why aren't you working? Um, Art by MB said, I seriously wish I had taken a business course when I was in college. I have a master's in teaching, but promoting my art, I am terrible. Thank you for all your advice. Um, yeah, I think we all are. It's probably one of the main reasons we have this whole starving artist thing. We don't know how to market ourselves. Some of the best artists in the world, like amazing artists, they don't sell anything. They don't know how to market. I'm don't, it, it's a challenge. Um, that's its whole thing. Other thing. Luckily there are a lot of videos on, sorry, my back has had about enough of me being alive today. Um, there are enough, there are a lot of marketing videos on YouTube that are free. You just have to figure out who you can trust and who you can listen to because there's a lot of bad advice too. So some of the ones that I really like are, is it Wes McDonald, Wes McDowell, Wes McSomething. Um, and I like him and what was the other guy's name? I can't think. There's two that I watch, um, fairly often. Yeah. You got to find people who are good. And the really bad thing is the people who are selling art marketing advice for artists are usually, I don't want to call them scammers. I'm just going to leave that there, but yeah, there, it's not, it's not worth anything. They're, and you've got to watch too, like there was one, oh my gosh, this was hilarious. What was it for? VidIQ. So they're like your coaches and stuff for, for our videos. They had an ad and I was reading through, like they had their, you know, you can get it, sign up for our coaching or whatever. And somebody commented under there going, um, you can't grow as a YouTuber if you're Australian or some, something. It was not true. It, he made a statement that is just absolutely not true. You just have to have good content. He didn't have good content. So I looked him up. This guy is selling how to succeed as YouTube. His channel's like a thousand. He didn't succeed. At, like you can't honestly have only gotten that far and you already think you're going to be giving other people lessons and advice on how to succeed on YouTube. He's got this page on a, a website. I went and looked at it and it's all, it makes it sound like he's doing so good, but you look up anyone he's worked with, no one's grown more than a thousand or so. Like I'm like, you're claiming that the reason you didn't succeed that you can't succeed because you're in Australia, but I can help you succeed because you live in the US. 
not a thing, not how that works at all. But yeah, it, it was bizarre um, how often you get somebody trying to teach you something that they themselves don't know what they're doing. Hence, a lot of the beginner stuff I've been talking about. Um, so yeah, that is, if you can find good ones, there are people who will teach you and give you good marketing advice for free. Because yeah, schools don't teach us a lot of what would be very helpful as artists, that's for sure. Um... Audrey said, hi, so when glazing, what is the ratio of oil paint and medium do you use? It depends on what I'm doing and how thin I need it to be. There's no formula there at all. The only formula I can ever give you is when I make phthalo or teal, 50% phthalo blue, 50 phthalo green. That is it. Other than that, there is no formula. It depends on if I want it more translucent, more medium. If I want it less translucent, less medium. That is the formula. Um, let's see. <laughs> Nick said, Lisa must not be allowed to keep tonight's painting. She has too many. Yeah, I don't think anyone bid on that one. Um, that's two in a row that I will end up adding to my website for more than I'm selling it for tonight. That's for sure. If you want it for cheap, now's the time to grab it. That is this guy here for $70. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have Art by MV said, this goes uh, to your cookie on Saturday, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. My Lisa's pants don't fit cookie. Wade's like, I would like a cookie. You get a cookie too, come get your super chat. You can, you want a super chat? Come on, you can come get a super chat. They're all, they, this time of the, the live stream, they're pretty much just out. I'm gonna give them one anyway, even though it's for my cookie. There you go, good boys. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Five Minute of the Moon said, I know it's always fat over lean. I would think yes. Fat over lean, but that's a little bit of a different situation. Um, that's, that's a whole other topic. That's not really to do with the glazing. I mean, it could be to do with glazing because you wouldn't want to glaze something that dries really fast on top of really thick paint, but that's not how I work anyway, so that doesn't really. Uh, dolphin Soul, you said you should have added, added dolphins, you know, it'll sell. I think that would have taken a little longer than what we had for tonight's live stream. Um, did we have any other questions in here? I think I'm caught up on everything. You boys go lay down. We're not just going to stand here. Go. Thought you were being sneaky just standing there, huh? Lay down. All the way. Oh, we're going to stretch first. Okay. And down they go. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining tonight. Make sure to check out our moderator's channels. Links are in the video description for that. Do I have anything else? Um, Fly Me to the Moon said, she said you can highlight with oil over colored pencil. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but here's the thing. You really shouldn't be oil painting on paper that hasn't been gessoed. But you generally don't want to work colored pencil on paper that's been gessoed unless you're using powder blender and that's a whole other situation i would not use oil paint as a highlighter the way that the oil itself spreads and the way that it can affect the pencils would not be my go-to definitely would not be my go-to can someone do it i mean you can do a lot of things i can feed my dogs dark chocolate but it's probably not the best idea in the world you're not getting chocolate don't lick your lips. Oh, acrylic paint. Okay, now that's a whole other situation. So if somebody wants to put acrylic highlights on top of colored pencil, no, not archival. That, that isn't even a meh, no, it's a no, because your acrylic paint is a water-based product. You're putting water base on top of wax and oil base. Not the way to go it. Oil and water, remember how that works? We did that in science class. I don't know if they do that in science class anymore. Uh, but if they do, that's a thing that we do not want to be doing. You can do a, you know, a water-based product, and in that case, I would go with colored pencil, or with watercolor, not with acrylics. But you can, you can do watercolor first and colored pencil on top, not the reverse. You don't want to put water-based products, in that case, acrylics, on top. You are going to run into an archival issue. Will it stay? Yeah, but I don't know for how long because it's putting a water-based product on top of an acrylic or a uh, wax and oil base, so no. Gouache? Nope. Water-based. Can't do gouache either. I say can't. I mean, you can do it, but your work is not archival and you should feel kind of crappy if you're selling work that is not archival. Um... What could you use? So if I want to do highlights, and I'll be doing that on the Collie, if I want to do highlights on my, um, stop it. 
If I want to do highlights on colored pencil that aren't just colored pencil, there are two main ways that I get highlights. One, I don't have them in front of me. Of course I don't because I lost everything tonight. Um, a fabric castell perfection eraser, I will erase an area and I can put white highlights will now stick to the paper wherever I erased. So let's say I need a white highlight. I can erase that little spot. I'm not trying to get the paper back to white. I'm just lifting whatever pencil is there and that white will show up super well now. Um, white be ideally being one of your wax based pencils. So in my case, my Derwent Light Fast is my like go to for that for being to really opaque. Um, burping over here. I'm a classy lady. Um, the other would be touch up texture, titanium white mixture that I love. It's made specifically for colored pencil. I mix those two products together and I have videos showing you how to do that. So if you just look up lock Cree and touch up texture, titanium white, uh, or lock Cree, how to get white highlights and colored pencil, that video, I think I'm showing you with whiskers on a tiger, but you can paint it on and it's made for colored pencil. It is compatible with colored pencil. You'll let that dry all the way. And even if you didn't want it white, you can now put colored pencil on top of that and tint it to whatever color you want. So that would be the way to go. Okay. Um, can I see pictures of, where can I see pictures of dragon? Uh, my Instagram there, if you scroll back, there is a recent one. Uh, I don't know if you're on our discord. If you're on Patreon and in our discord, I can post some cause I got some today and some videos of him just being goofy and adorable and he's super cute, but he put himself to bed and I don't want to bug him right now. He's, the lights are on, but he goes to a certain, he has two spots he likes to sleep and he's in one of them right now. He was super active today, so I think he's probably all worn out. Um, so yeah, but I've got a, you'll also see him in the video that I'm currently editing, but yeah, head over to Instagram and I think that's the easiest place to find it. I don't remember if I posted it on MeWe. Um, I think we are good. Okay, I will see, 10.02, look, I went over, even though I'm half asleep. I'm impressed I got through this tonight. Um, I will see you guys next week. It will be something in colored pencil and probably colored pencil and pan pastels because that goes quickly. I think that's what we're gonna do. Either that or charcoal, I don't know. Um, I will see you guys. Are my glasses bifocal? No, they need to be. Um, Instead, I'm doing this constantly to see what I need to see. Um, but anyway, thank you guys so much, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.